stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful in my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for... Hey, let's do that last verse. Ushers, come on down. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the age just to sing of his love for me. <clears throat> how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me turn in your bibles if you would please to jude the next to the last book of the bible to jude I'm going to start at verse number 12, I think, and read through the, well, 14, probably 15. There are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds, they are without water. Carried about of winds, tree whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Father, bless this lesson to the hearts of the people in Jesus' name, amen. This is a pretty tough uh, portion of scripture uh, when it deals with uh, uh, verse number 15. He's coming back to execute judgment of all, up, upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. Knows that word three times? Ungodly. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I thought that's kind of neat. Ladies and gentlemen, the people out there in the world don't understand Christians that are truly born again Christians. If you're born into the family of God, you're saved by the blood of Christ and you are a changed person and unbelievers cannot fathom in their mind the change that you went through. They can't explain it. They try their best to say, well, what's happened to that person? Why are they different? Why have they changed? Why all of a sudden do they think they are better than we are? And you heard all these things? Well, he's a holy Joe. Well, he's a, he's a church mouse. 
All of a sudden, he thinks he's better than everybody else. What has happened to him? They do not understand the miraculous new birth. When you're saved by the blood of the crucified one, you are made over. They cannot understand that. They look at you like you all of a sudden have fallen off the, uh, the deep end and you are going, you, you've gone nuts. I've had many experiences like that. I told you about the time I went to the gas station. I could hear them out of my ears as I was walking to the gas station saying, guys, all oh, watch your mouth now. Here comes the preacher. Here comes the preacher. So I walked into the room and started preaching. I just preached up a storm. I mean, they're all sitting there staring at me. So what are you doing? I said, I'm preaching because after all, if you're going to introduce me as a preacher, I might as well preach. Amen? Or just keep your mouth shut and I'll come in here and pay my bill. If you don't want to hear preaching, don't introduce me because when somebody introduces me as a preacher, I preach. I can preach. I was at the Royal Stadium one time sitting up there on the back row and uh, this lady right next to me started screaming for a beer. Every time she screamed for a beer, I'd say, I'm not touching it. Beer man, I'm not touching it. Beer man, I'm not touching it. She finally looked at me and said, what are you, what are you a Baptist? I said, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, I sure am. She said, well, I'm a Baptist. I said, well, shame on you. Now, see, there's two kinds of Baptists. There's saved Baptist, lost Baptist. There's two kinds of Methodists. Saved Methodist, lost Methodist. There's, there, there's two kinds of Presbyterian. Saved Methodist, lost Methodist. You can tell a person as a Christian on how they produce fruit. See, we're not to judge anybody. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. So we don't judge people. What we become, though, as a Christian, and not on purpose, but because normally we become what is called a fruit inspector. Have you ever gone to an apple tree and checked it, make it sure it was ripe? Make sure that wasn't a, a, going to be a sour apple. Or have you ever gone to a peach tree and said, mm hmm, no, that's too hard? You know, I want a soft peach. Have you ever done that? Well, can you tell, do you ever eat a green? Do you ever agree? Do you, most people don't like green apples. Some like green fried tomatoes, and some, but some people like green apples, but most people would rather not. They think it gives them a tummy ache. Uh, my grandma used to tell me about that. She says, don't eat the green apples. They'll give you a tummy ache. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, and it, it, it would. It would give some people. It wouldn't give all people, but some people didn't get it. But in the book of Jude, we have some strange sayings here in this book. For instance, it's full of unique figures of speech. It speaks of raging waves of the sea. It speaks of wandering stars. It speaks of trees whose fruit withereth and clouds without water carried about of winds. It's kind of strange sayings found in Jude. Well, have you turned around and listened to some Christians' strange sayings? I mean, unbelievers' strange sayings. They'll say things like, there's more ways to heaven than one. Have you heard that one? Well, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Well, all you have to do is believe in God to get there. There's more roads to heaven than just one road. I mean, they'll, tell, they'll, they'll come up with some strange sayings, the lost will. Well, God will take, in my, God will take me under consideration. He'll, 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 he'll weigh my good versus my bad, and I think I'll be all right. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? I think I'll be there, all right? Yeah, I think I'm okay. Well, I don't know that I want to think about my eternity, do you? I want to know about my eternity. Amen. Trouble of it is, is nobody wants to do what you have to do in order to know about your eternity. Amen. So you got to repent. 
You got to change your ways. You got to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You know, you got you to honestly know what the truth is. Men who exalt human reason above divine revelation are clouds without water. You know what? They're clouds without water. Man thinks, but what God says, excuse me, let me read it again. It is not what man reasons. It's not what man reasons. It's what God reveals that makes the difference. You see, God will tell you from the Bible how he wants you to do things. It doesn't matter if it's getting saved or living your life. He'll tell you how he wants you to do it. He reveals that to you in his book. You know what the main problem is? The main problem and the attack of the devil to people is this. The Bible is just another book. That's the biggest problem. And I tell people, no, the Bible is not another book. The Bible is the book. The Bible is holy. It's the holy book. It's the holy Bible. It's God's word. But what the devil wants people to believe is that man wrote it, therefore it's got errors in it. Man never wrote it, God wrote it. Man just pinned it down. Always got something to say or else how could they explain why they could directly go against the word of God? Directly go against it. For instance, when it comes to lying, man wants to change that. Oh, it was just a little white lie. God says a lie is a lie. Well, I'm not as bad as other people are. Well, that's wrong because everybody else is the same as you are. Just a sinner. Well, God understands why I did it. No, God understands what he said, what he reveals, not what you think. Man always wants to think that God's on his side, but no, God's on his side. God loves everybody and he reveals to everybody what he wants them to do and he does not change. That's why he sent his son. He sent his son to die so everybody could have the same opportunity. You see, the rich man can get saved if he wants to, wants to if he'll repent. The poor man can get saved if he wants to repent. God is no respecter of persons. He does not treat anybody any different than anybody else. He treats everybody the same according to what he has done for mankind. He sent his son to die and shed his blood for everyone. It's unique. It is not what man thinks, but what God says. Man always are saying something like this. Well, I think, I think I'll be all right. I think God will understand. No, that's not it. It is not what man thinks, but what God says, and if God says it, he means it. He says it, that's final word. You don't have to ask anybody else. There's no authority above God. The, man, the mind of man can never discover the heart of God. Man's mind always gets him in trouble. As a man thinketh, the Bible says, in his heart, so is he. By wisdom, this world has never come to know God. God's wisdom is foolishness to men. And man's wisdom is foolishness to God. We are not left to reason we have a revelation to live by. We have the Bible. We have the Word of God. Questions and over and over and again, people say. And now, by the way, I'm going to talk to you about churches for just a minute. Elm Grove Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church. God says it, that settles it. Somebody said, well, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. It don't make no matter if you believe it or not. If God says it, that settles it. You don't have to worry. 
Just believe what he says. Now, people will come out and they'll find some of the strangest things in the Bible and try to prove that the Bible is not true. The Bible says, you know, unless you hate your mother and your father, you've heard that verse. What God is saying there is that God should come before your mother and father. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's first. Nothing comes before that. God is a jealous God. He, he wants what you, he wants your heart. He wants you to love him. He wants you to serve him. It's always the people that decides to go against God that gets in trouble. Every time. Men who exalt human attainment above divine atonement are clouds without water. Remember what I said a while ago? Men who exalt human reason above divine revelation are clouds without water. Now men who exalt human attainment above divine atonement are clouds without water. Attainment is possible to man. Atonement is possible only with God. You can attain some things and being a man, you know, look at some of the rich people out there. Look what they have attained. But they haven't, attained, but they haven't got atonement. See, they need to have their sins covered. They need to have their sins washed away. What good does it do? Let me ask you a question. I have never in my life seen a hearse, seen a, seen a, uh, a, a U-Haul stashed with money or precious stones following a hearse to the, to, the, to the graveyard. Have you? They can't take it with them. You come into this world with nothing, you go out with nothing. I mean, there's more fights, arguments, screaming after someone dies with, because of what they have. Do you know that? People are people fight over a dead person's wealth. Someone told me that Jerry Lewis, the comedian, never left a dime to any of his children. He did not want his kids to have what he had. People say, let them earn it themselves. I did. Well, I don't know about that, but I know one thing. <clears throat> Here's what I believe. I believe this. Attainment is possible to man, but atonement is possible only with God. And you, I don't care what you have. You can be as rich as all get out and die and die miserable, screaming into hell. This is a perfect example. That's found in the book of, 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 of Luke where the rich man died. And in hell, the Bible said, he lifted up his eyes. How long did it take him to get to hell after he died? Same length of time he gets a person to heaven when they die. Attainment is what man can do. Atonement is something God can do. When I got saved, I got washed in the blood of Jesus. I never said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start living better. I went to church last week, heard the preacher preach. I've decided that I'm going to start living better. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start being nice to people. I went to church and was the same person every time I left that church for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday until I got saved. Then I became a new person. Then the things I talk about doing, I did automatically. But I couldn't do it until I got saved. I had to do it God's way. I could not do it my way. My way did not work. At attainment is what man can do. Atonement is something God can do. Attainment makes man appear better before man. Atonement makes it possible for man to appear before God without guilt or sin. There's a difference between attainment and atonement. When you get your blood, when you get your sins covered. Now, we want to talk about churches for a minute. So here's a people, a multitude of people, a crowd of people. They go to a church. The pastor, he grew up. He's a sincere man. He went to a, a liberal college. He doesn't, he doesn't believe anything. He's been taught by man. 
The best way to do is make sure that when you go to a college, you go to a Bible-believing college that, are, that the professors are taught by God. And therefore, they can teach you what God has to say. I, uh, you know, I don't like to do this, but I'm going to do it today because... Okay, I want to do something. I want you to know that every word in this Bible is of God. I want to show you something. Turn to your book of the Revelation, please, and look at verse number one. Let me show you something that can happen. Notice the, start, the, the top of that book and the, and the introduction to the book of Revelation. Does your book, does yours say the revelation of St. John the Divine? Whose does? Mine does. Does yours? Whose book says, yours says St. John the Divine? Let me ask you a question. Was John, was John the Baptist divine? Who, by the way, those those. Uh, that's not holy writ, what you just read there. That was put there by man. John was a sinner. He was not divine. Who was divine? Jesus was divine. But you see how Satan can easily get you to think, well, John, John, was, John, John, was, uh, John was divine. No. Now, I'll tell you something else that's not inspired. Chapter divisions nor verse divisions. They're not inspired. They're put there by who? Man, they can mess you up. That particular statement right there, St. John the Divine. John wasn't divine. John was a sinner, same as you as I. You agree? Okay. Now, you'll go to a church and the, and the preacher, let me tell you, when you first see a church going liberal, when they quit giving an invitation, You'll go to church and the preacher will speak. He'll say amen. He'll say good things. He'll say amen. He will not give anybody else an opportunity to repent. He will never preach against sin. He'll never preach against, he'll never preach that there's a hell. He'll never, hey look, he'll never preach that the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of the living God. He won't do it. That's why they changed the Bible over and over and over and over and over again. They're trying to find a Bible that fits man. Our Bible is supposed to convict man. It's supposed to help man, teach man, convict man. You're supposed to be able to go to church, hear a Bible message, and get something from it that stirs your heart and your soul. Don't you agree? You're supposed to go to church and feel, look, I'm a dirty person that needs to be cleaned up. Do you agree? That's what the Bible's supposed to do. Clean you up. You see, men who exalt human philosophy above divine prophecy are clouds without water. Philosophy is what man thinks he knows. Prophecy is what God foreknows. Do you agree there? Man thinks he can get to heaven his way. God says there's only one way. Everybody has a different philosophy out there in the world on how a person can get to heaven. I've had people say to me, Seba thinks he knows it all. I don't know anything. But I know God knows it all. And if I'm going to quote anything, I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote what God knows. Not what I know. I know this. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I received Jesus as my Savior. I now am waiting to go to heaven. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you what God says in His book to teach me to be the kind of person God wants me to be. That's what I want to be. Someone asked me one time, he said, well, I had somebody criticize the King James Bible to me one time. Now, the first thing I thought of thought to do was get in the flesh because that's human thinking. 
I looked at the individual and said, what do you know about the King James Bible? He said, nothing, and I don't want to know nothing. I said, and that's your problem. That's not mine, so don't bring it up to me. That's the book I believe in. That's the book that I love. Let me ask you a question. If you were going to talk to somebody about going to church, would you just tell them to go to any church? Or would you tell them to go to a church that preaches the Bible? You want to know what the Bible says. If I'm going to go to church, I want to know what God says. I don't want to know what... Look, I'm an old-fashioned guy. Look, you guys know how old-fashioned I am. I think you ought to go to church and dress up. I don't think you ought to dress down to go to church. I think, God, I think you ought to give God your best, not your second best, not your third best. Not your, I, that's what I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I believe we ought to have church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And the day that I leave this church, I'm going to say, I will from the pulpit, the last sermon I preach, say, keep the doors open when the doors are supposed to be open. Don't let somebody come along and say, it's inconvenient. It was inconvenient for Jesus to carry a cross up Calvary's mountain. He did it because he loved us. I expect we ought to take some inconveniency sometimes because we love God. You agree? And I don't think it's inconvenient. I think a Christian, look, I'm disciples, I wish I could have been one of the 12 because they was with Jesus all the time. I would have liked that. That wouldn't, hey, only when people left Jesus is when he preached hard preaching. He started preaching things that were tough. Then the Bible says in John 6, 66, they followed him no more. When it gets hard, that's when you get better. When things get tough and you have to accept that, that's when things get better. A coach, I was in physical fitness when I was a kid, and, and Jody knows about this. You get stronger when it gets harder. Ain't that right, Jody? If you can do 30 push-ups, the coach will want you to do 35. If you can do 35, he'll make you do 40. The more you do, the stronger you get. The more you read the Bible, the stronger you get. The more you memorize the Bible, the stronger you get. It gets tough. But it comes to the point when you, all of a sudden 75 push-ups is easy for you. All of a sudden you can tell people how to get saved. Get them to, look, the more you know the Bible, the more you can help people find God. Clouds without water. That's what most of the churches today in America are about. That's why America's in trouble. That's why we're living in the Laodicea age instead of the Philadelphia age. Brotherly love is gone. It's all about hatred today. We live in a day when people laugh at the preacher, laugh at the church, laugh at the Bible, laugh at those that go to church. Revivals have very few cars in it. On Saturday night, beer joints are loaded. Expect that. That's the way it has always been and will always be. Remember, there's broad as a road that leads into destruction and many find it. But straight is a path and narrow is a way that leads into eternal life and few be there to find it. Let's just change. Satan comes along. You don't think Satan is powerful? Look at all the little religions he started. Look at all, look, look what he's done to the ones who used to be faithful and dedicated. The churches that used to be soul winning churches are no longer soul winning churches. Satan comes along and destroys it. Clouds without water. Ladies and gentlemen, this Bible study is for the fact that somewhere along the line, somebody's going to discourage you from being what you are. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to mock what you believe. They've done it to me. They've done it to everybody that's ever been saved. Don't join the crowd. Jesus had already warned us. If they hate me, they also hate you, he said. Remember, if they hate you, they first hated me first. They'll laugh at you. They'll mock what you believe. Even people you think wouldn't do it. Some of your best friends will turn against you. I've seen parents turn against their kids. Well, he thinks he's... I went to, I went to 
I went to a, a visit a, fa a couple one time when I was first saved. I wasn't even married at the time. I went to the house to talk to him because the individual was going to uh, show me some things out of the Bible he wanted to show me, and he wasn't there. And I says to the grandfather who opened the door, I says, are they at church? They're always at church. As if that was a bad thing. <laughs> what better place would you rather be? Now, you know, let me tell you something. You look around here, Wednesday night crowds. Now, I understand the teenagers that sit right there are over there. All the kids are up there, <laughs> you know. So there'll be a lot more in here if, there's all, that was, if they were all in here. But Wednesday night is still the least attended church service. Then there comes Sunday night. Then there comes Sunday school. And then on Sunday morning at 10.30 or well, it used to be 11 o'clock on the worship service is when your church is mostly full. Those are the people that I've always believed was my job to teach the importance of being here tonight. How many like coming to Wednesday night? Wednesday night is a teaching night. You get taught things and you are warned. Now on Sunday morning at 12 o'clock when most people come, that's when Satan wants them to come. Because they're going to get a sermon on salvation. But they're not going to learn anything. See, once a Christian is already saved, what's Satan's responsibility? If he can't get them before they're saved, what does he want to do then? He wants them not to know nothing. 45% of the people that join the Jehovah's Witnesses are Baptist. You know why? They don't know nothing. They haven't been taught about cults. They haven't been taught that certain things are wrong. They haven't been taught that you've got to be aware of certain people. The Bible teaches that over and over again. That's why you come Wednesday night. That's why you get a sermon like this on Wednesday night. Beware of those that will hurt you. Mark them that cause contrary or cause, cause division. And mark them and avoid them, the Bible says. Avoid them. Avoid those people that hurt you. You might love them. Talk to them. Be friendly to them. But don't associate with them. You see, if a married, if a, if a, if a man, excuse me, yeah, yeah, I'll use that. If a man, a Christian man, marries a unchristian woman, mark it down, he's going to have trouble from his father-in-law. Who's his father-in-law? The devil. Because if a child of God marries a child of the devil, guess who's going to give him trouble? And by the way, I have done a lot of marriages in my life. Over half, now maybe not over half, but right at a half. About half are in, have ended in divorce because they, two that are not together, well, you've you got to be agreed. Except two be agreed they cannot make it. They got to be agreeable on things. Debbie and I got married. She believed exactly the same thing I did. Did we ever have an argument? Yes. Time or two. She'd been mad at me a time or two. But she's still with me. Because our marriage was based on faith and God and the Bible. God says it's important. It's important that you are not unequally yoked. Amen. You've got to be, you've got to, if you're a saved person, needs to marry a saved person. I remember what John Rice says about kids. He said, I think every Christian should have 15 kids. He said, I think every heathen couple shouldn't have any. Because Christian woman, like Suzanne Wesley, she had 19 children. Well, some people come to her and said, you didn't need to take the pill. You need to do something to keep them having kids. Well, she wouldn't have had number nine. She wouldn't have had Charles Wesley and we wouldn't have the songs we got in our, in our hymn book. She wouldn't have had uh, 13. We wouldn't have had the Methodist church. Because Charles, I mean, because, uh, John Wesley founded it. Where, and by the way, that was a soul winning church for years, the Methodist church was. That's why you see a Methodist church in every little town in the country. Don't you? 
Everywhere you go, you'll see a Methodist church. How did that come about? Because the evangelistic thrust of John Wesley, the founder of the... But, ladies and gentlemen, we got Baptist churches in America today that don't have services on Sunday night or Wednesday night and do not preach out of the Bible. They preach a Bible, but they don't preach out of the Bible. We got Baptist churches in the East Coast that close during the summertime. Sorry, closed for the summer. I seen it on a sign when I was in Maine. First Baptist church closed until, until uh, uh, September. That's what I said. Baptism is another problem. People just don't get it. It's easy to understand baptism by immersion. Death to yourself, buried like Jesus was buried, rise again in newness of life like Jesus was. We follow his example. Going to church is a problem. Faithfulness, be there when the doors are open. Giving, why wouldn't you want to give to God's house? Don't you think this kind of work needs to go forward? Well, you can't get out of, you can come to this church, we take an offering, you don't got to put a, a dime in it. You can't go to Price Chopper. You go in there, you put anything in your basket, you're going to pay for it. Amen? But you're going to get a lot tonight and you didn't have to put a dime in the plate. But God has taught us how to give. Satan don't want you to give. Satan don't want the churches to grow. Satan don't want the churches to, to be full. I want the church full. I want it to be as full as possible. And we can still do it if we try hard enough. Father, thank you for tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll bless the services and the Bible study and the prayer meeting. In Jesus' name, amen.